Okay. All right, so this is one of our Zoom series available for dentists, healthcare providers. At this time during the coronavirus, the IABDM wants to uh, actually do something for you so that you understand the value of being a member. Those of you that are not members, we hope you join our group because we've got some other fantastic values of uh, getting some continued education right now, as well as going ahead and using this time to get certified. I would like to introduce <laughs> Dr. Lee, who has lectured for us several times in the past and has been very gracious uh, about coming on to one of our Zoom meetings. So, Dr. Levy, if you'll take it away. Okay, you my, you see my slides, correct? I do. Okay. Does, does everybody else see them? Yes, I do see them. Okay. All right. Well, I want to talk today about, as the title says, vitamin C and acute viral syndromes. I want to start with a little information that I consider to be foundational information so uh, everybody can better appreciate why vitamin C does what it does. And I'll go through some of these slides quick because I have a lot of slides and I just want you to let, let you know the information's there and I'll be talking in more depth about the, the later on slides of the presentation as we start to address Corona. Uh, this reference checking. Now the unified theory for the cause of all disease really is quite simple, even though disease is very complex. It turns out that all diseases, and I mean 100%, I've looked very hard to find an exception to this rule and I've yet to find one. It's always characterized and caused by increased intracellular oxidative stress, increased IOS. Now, many of you have seen this before, but I want to make sure it's clear that all prooxidants are toxins, all toxins are prooxidants. Uh, all nutrient molecules are antioxidant in nature. So a prooxidant is characterized by its ability to take electrons away from biomolecules. This is oxidation. In an antioxidant, quite the opposite, can redonate electrons and restore a previously inactivated oxidized biomolecule back to its reduced functioning state. And in a nutshell then, this part is simple because, and this is especially pertinent now that we'll be talking about coronavirus in a bit, all disease then relates to relative amounts and concentrations of toxins or prooxidants and antioxidants, and also pathogens, not just acute infections, but chronic colonizations, uh, silent focal infections that don't appear to be clinically causing problems. All of these things are your hugest sources of toxin providers, they're providers. And uh, I've talked about this in the past, but because vitamin C is an antioxidant that's extremely small, donates two electrons per molecule, gets literally in every cell in the body, basically the same as glucose, which it's very similar to, it's what you would term an absolute antitoxin. No matter what the toxin is, if you get enough vitamin C in its presence with access molecule to molecule, Vitamin C will donate electrons and basically inactivate or neutralize the toxic effect. Okay. Uh, pretty much covered that. I want to say, too, we use it with a lot of different terms out there. Toxin is a prooxidant, is a free radical, is a poison. Those all mean the same thing. Okay. A lot of times you get in the scientific literature. And wow, I, I once was researching free iron because it uh, have, causes a very oxidizing environment inside the cell. And I found 25 synonyms in the literature. I mean, that's one thing that makes the literature so convoluted is there's no little agreement on nomenclature. Pathogens are especially oxidative bombs because they produce endotoxins, exotoxins, 
oxidized metabolic byproducts. And, and as they die, they release free iron. Okay, and this is also very pro-oxidant. So to flip it around, if a toxin, if a substance, an agent does not cause oxidation, it is not a toxic and it cannot be toxic. Now, I call, I'll talk about biomolecules. These are every functioning molecule in your tissues and in your cells. Nucleic acid, proteins, enzymes, sugars, fats. And the important point there is to remember that they have a natural function and they have that function when they're in the electron sated reduced state. When a toxin comes along and takes one or more electrons away from the biomolecule, puts it in the oxidized state, then it becomes inactive or severely reduced in activity. And this in fact is disease. Uh, it might seem like a fine point, but oxidative stress does not cause disease. Oxidative stress is the disease. You don't have any intrinsic abnormality of a cell in any disease process beyond the degree to which it, the, the component biomolecules are oxidized. Like you don't have an Alzheimer's cell or a fibromyalgia cell that has some additional ill-defined quality making it an Alzheimer's cell. It's only an Alzheimer's cell because there's a unique array of biomolecules in different concentrations and different locations that are in the oxidized state. And of course, this summarizes how you have so many different presentations. You have to deal with what biomolecules are oxidized, where are they located, is their degree of oxidation minimal, moderate, advanced, and have, they, have, have those biomolecules been oxidized for a long period of time, a few days, few weeks, few months, or many years. All that has to do, when you combine it all together, that gives you the unique disease presentation in that person. Toxin characteristics, you might say, well, how can one, how can so many toxins just, well, uh, how can you have different uh, presentation of different toxins is because of their chemical nature. How are they soluble? How big are they? Are they ionically charged? Do they have a unique fit, lock and key? Do they oxidize certain enzymes, etc.? All right, now, that's the foundation. That's my little blur on what is the nature of all disease, which is the degree to which you have uh, oxidative stress and oxidized biomolecules. What are then your most important sources of prooxidants or toxins? Well, this is the dental group, and we all know that there's a lot of dental toxins. We're not going to dwell on that, but we know all about the Focal infections, tonsils, root canals, asymptomatically infected teeth, cavitations, gum disease, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all significant because they produce large amounts of extremely toxic materials. The number two is not well recognized now, and I don't know that it is recognized at this point in time as a unique entity, but it's very much a unique, important entity and that's chronic pathogen colonization, especially in the sinuses, pharynx, and upper, upper respiratory tract. Uh, I don't have a chance to go into great detail on this. I'll give you some highlights on this. I have an article on this that I can refer you to later on, but I'm gonna tell you, it's my opinion, that the primary reason for leaky gut and chronically deranged bowel functions in an abnormal microbiome, which of course screws everything else in the body up, is due to the fact that so many people have biofilm covered chronic pathogen colonizations in their sinuses, nose, and throat. And as the young people like to say, 24 seven, you're swallowing these pathogens and their toxic byproducts directly into your GI tract. And like anywhere else, you overwhelm an area with toxins, you induce a great deal of oxidation, and then all the disease starts coming. Now there's known outside toxin exposures, toxic iron, I've talked about a lot, a lot of that in the past. The toxic gut, 
at the gut level, not what causes it, but at the gut level, there's a tremendous amount of toxicity from improperly digesting food. And then finally, hormonal imbalances, uh, primarily uh, sex hormones and thyroid hormone deficiencies. Now, so the treatment principles then for all chronic degenerative diseases, in my opinion, comes down to preventing and minimizing new toxin exposure. As my wonderful mentor, Hal Huggins, used to tell me, Tom, you can't dry off while you're still in the shower. And of course, he's right. Uh, you can repair a lot of damage, but that's going to be largely inconsequential or minimally consequential clinically if you don't stop the new damaging agents, the new toxins from coming into the body on a daily basis. Number two, you want to neutralize toxins already present. Number three, you want to excrete toxins in as minimally toxic a fashion as possible. Detoxification always involves some degree of retoxification. It probably, in a nutshell, although it's a much larger subject than this, one of your best ways to detoxify without retoxifying yourself is regular saunas. You can sweat out just about every type of toxin there is in your body. Number four, you want to resolve infections or, and I'll briefly touch upon this, there's so much information here, you need to take the measures to keep focal infections focal. There's a lot of people that get root canals and have heart attacks, and there's a lot of people that have root canals and don't get heart attacks for decades. And one of the main differences is these is what are the circumstances metabolically that allow the effect infections to stay put versus allow them to effectively metastasize. And ironically enough, not just in an, uh, as an analogy, but in a very real sense, this is the same thing that promotes metastasis of cancers or keeps cancers focal. We don't tend to think about this too much, but one, I think, entirely wrong-headed approach toward cancer in general is the hell-bent intent, especially by oncologists, to completely obliterate the tumors. Like when the tumor's gone, they've won. Well, not really. What they've done to eliminate the tumor has been to really weaken the rest of the body. On the other hand, the body is used to dealing with lots of different insults, and if you give it strong enough hormonal support, nutritional support, there's a lot of examples where you effectively live with your disease for a full lifespan. This can be the case with uh, different types of chronic infections. Uh, many AIDS patients have, are able with proper nutrition and supplementation or can go into a chronic state of well-being without a decrease in lifespan, but they never completely obliterate the infection. Now that'll highly vary, be variable from one person to the next, but just remember, <clears throat> it's not always so taken for granted that your only goal is to completely obliterate an infection or to completely obliterate a cancer. Obviously, you don't want the infection, and if you can get rid of the cancer without obliterating your immune system, that's of course desirable. Supplement optimally, we'll touch on that. <clears throat> and the importance of addressing hormone deficiencies, extremely critical. Now, I mentioned at the top of this that the characteristic of all chronic degenerative disease, of all diseases of any type, are the uh, is the fact that Inside the cells that are affected, you have increased intracellular oxidative stress. If you don't have increased oxidative, intracellular oxidative stress, increased IOS, you don't have a disease and you have a normal cell. Now, the primary determinants that determine whether the degree of your increased IOS are calcium, magnesium, vitamin C, and glutathione. And as such, they're the modulators of your degree of oxidative stress. Now, calcium, I wrote a book in 2013 called Death by Calcium. 
And I didn't even realize at the time I wrote that how that was going to lead me into writing my most recent book, which is Magnesium Reversing Disease. But in fact, they are the yin and the yang of the body. Uh, you don't have increased intracellular oxidative stress if you don't have increased intracellular calcium. It's that simple, that clear cut, never found an exception. I've looked hard for it. So the higher your calcium concentration goes, the higher your increased IOS goes, the more disease the cell is. And if it goes really high, you'll get malignant transformation. And if it goes even higher, you get cell death. So reading the underlying section here, the manipulation of intracellular calcium levels is the most straightforward way to positively impact IOS and thereby all disease processes. Now, statistically, it's very clear cut. Calcium supplementation increases your chance of death from all causes. Now, magnesium is the natural calcium channel antagonist in the body and a general calcium metabolism blocker antagonist. And this actually in a nutshell is why magnesium is so wonderful and believe me, it's wonderful. It's because you can't have elevated levels of calcium and magnesium. If the calcium's up, the magnesium's down. And if you can get the magnesium up, you will push the calcium down. And this is why magnesium and its deficiencies, magnesium deficiency causes as a primary reason many different diseases, but make no doubt about it, a magnesium deficiency aggravates 100% of diseases. There's no disease you can talk about that a magnesium deficiency does not make worse. And that's because it's not able to, uh, the low magnesium level is not effectively bringing your calcium levels down, but instead leaving them elevated. Uh, <clears throat> and we see that the more magnesium you take, you decrease all-cause mortality, just in the same fashion as extra calcium increases all-cause mortality. Now, vitamin C. When intracellular calcium levels are high, magnesium levels are low, vitamin C levels will always be low. You'll never have an, a normal vitamin C level inside a cell uh, where calcium levels are high. So there's this ongoing dynamic interplay between calcium metabolism, calcium, magnesium, and vitamin C. Now, glutathione is sort of a, it's very important, but it's a follower, not a leader. By that, I mean you want your cell to be normal and you want it to have normal levels of glutathione inside it since it's the most important and most concentrated intracellular antioxidant. However, your, your glutathione is predominantly synthesized, not assimilated from uh, food or supplements. And because these involve enzymes, these enzymes are in a cell with high intracellular oxidative stress. Guess what? They're oxidized. And what did I say about oxidized biomolecules? They don't function. So as long as the intracellular oxidative stress is elevated. Here. Hello? Okay. Can we, can we nuke the microphone? Uh, as long as the intracellular oxidative stress is elevated, uh, you'll never have normal glutathione levels. So it's only when you normalize calcium, magnesium, and vitamin C that then the synthetic machinery for glutathione works and that was, those levels come into normal as well. Now with regard to hormones, it's my opinion that there's two primary things about hormones. Well, number one, they positively modulate normal metabolism. And number two, very importantly, I don't think there's a hormone that exists that does not minimize or normalize this increased IOS. What I consider to be the most important ones, insulin, hydrocortisone, thyroid hormone, and sex hormones. And these actually all play critical roles in either pulling magnesium or vitamin C directly into the cell. Hydrocortisone, for example, strongly 
pulls vitamin C inside the cell. Hydrocortisone is known to be your most important anti-inflammatory agent. I would submit to you that it's the most important anti-inflammatory agent <clears throat> because it pulls vitamin C into the cell, which is really the singular most important anti-inflammatory agent, vitamin C. So that's the goal. And just remember that in trying to get your goal of normalizing vitamin C levels inside the cell, you're really never gonna achieve that just with vitamin C supplementation. I mean, it's, the supplementation is always good, make no doubt about it. But as you refine your goal toward minimizing oxidative stress inside the cell and maximizing vitamin C concentrations, it's gonna take a little bit more than just C supplementation. So I consider then the main ways to optimize intracellular vitamin C levels are optimizing estrogen or testosterone, thyroid, insulin, and hydrocortisone. Number two, eliminating or containing, keeping focal infections focal, and eliminating and maintaining, maintaining yourself free of chronic pathogen colonization. Body-wide levels of magnesium are extremely important to keep those elevated optimal digestion, and other supplements. Now, I'm gonna really do a quick review here, and I'm not gonna to dwell too long on each one of these slides, so I'm gonna wing through them. Most of what we know about vitamin C clinically comes, clinically comes from Dr. Klenner, and he found that vitamin C could reliably cure most infectious diseases and neutralize any toxin. Vitamin C has been proven in the test tube to neutralize polio, and many other significant best, uh, viruses, as we can see here. Uh, and also to make a note of influenza virus, which we'll get a little into a little bit more later. Clinically, that was test tube. Clinically, vitamin C has been clearly shown to cure acute polio in a mere 60 out of 60 cases, pretty close to 100%. And also, sometimes able to resolve the paralysis associated with it. Kletter found that you gave uh, intravenous and oral worked, and when you gave large doses of oral, that worked as well. This also has been shown to resolve acute hepatitis, not chronic, and Dr. Cathcart really treated a lot of folks, and he never maintained that he never had a vitamin C treated hepatitis patient that subsequently developed chronic hepatitis. This was his general approach to acute hepatitis. It is probably a good way to think about how he approached most of his acute infectious diseases. Five to, 500 to 700 milligrams of vitamin C per kilogram of body weight every eight to 12 hours. Of note, that doesn't get much emphasis and is very important and often neglected even by our uh, integrative physicians is that at the same time you're giving the intravenous, give generous doses of oral as well. Uh, vitamin C is a resolved cases of viral encephalitis with patients in coma. Of course, this is the infamous H1N1 swine flu patient in New Zealand. That was on New Zealand 60 Minutes. If you've never seen that video, I would highly encourage you to watch it. And the main childhood diseases have been cured by C. Measles, mumps, acute herpes. Uh, in animals, it's cured rabies and been very effective in many other non-viral infections. But the, look at these. These are some really ones that are cause a lot of problems in hospitals, which just needn't be the case, but streptococcus, staphylococcus, pseudomonas, diphtheria, tetanus. So in a nutshell, vitamin C with pathogens. Vitamin C is an absolute viricide. It will inactivate, destroy, or break down any virus it encounters. It's often bactericidal, which means kills the bacteria, but it's almost always bacteriostatic, which keeps the bacterial pathogen from uh, uh, multiplying. And then finally, very importantly, it's always strongly supportive of an optimally competent immune system. And let me just say, it's my opinion again, I wanna emphasize that, that 
the primary role of the immune system is really to deliver vitamin C where it's most depleted. The monocyte, which is the main first line immune cell, has 8,000% more vitamin C inside it than in the blood. So when these cells come in, they're the first cells to appear at the site of infection, inflammation, which are all uniquely, severely vitamin C depleted states. And what do the cells do? They basically, for lack of a more elegant term, start dumping vitamin C on the area, just like they're putting out an oxidative fire with a water hose. So regardless of your condition, you want to decrease intracellular calcium, increase magnesium. And this is interesting too. When you increase intracellular magnesium, you also increase vitamin C uptake because you upregulate the vitamin C transporter expression. So you can see how all these things work together and which is why uh, you never want to take a mono supplemental approach to something. Uh, increase C, increase glutathione. Now, I told you what vitamin C did to polio. Well, guess what? Magnesium, it's pretty incredible information, but magnesium as a magnesium chloride oral solution. Here's the formula. Dr. Niveau in France in the 1940s reported on 15 cases of polio, and he cured all of them with just magnesium chloride solution. Some of them very, very quickly. Uh, the diagnosis was absolutely spot on and one child was well in 24 hours, but he also treated patients months after the onset of their polio and that already had flaccid paralysis of a limb. These people recovered as well, almost all with complete limb function, but some with just a little bit of residual damage. Now, another important way in optimizing intracellular oxidative stress is nebulization. And I'll talk about this a bunch. Um, there's a lot of, you could really just about nebulize anything that's water-based and doesn't cause you to be averse to it or coughing or uh, not having a pleasant experience when you inhale it. If it's, if it's well tolerated and comfortable as you inhale it and it's water soluble, you can experiment a lot on your own on different conditions. I've worked with DMSO, magnesium chloride, sodium ascorbate, zinc, colloidal silver, sodium bicarb, and acetylcysteine, iodine, and also I'll give you a lot of information on this, hydrogen peroxide. Chronic pathogen colonization, what the devil is it? Well, it's a commonly occurring but still little appreciated chronic medical condition and I submit to you, it's the major cause, the major cause of chronic leaky gut. Another strong contributing factor is all the iron that gets put in enriched food, metallic iron filings, etc. That all really screws up the gut too. But if you're eating an organic diet or a gluten-free diet, which also doesn't have iron in it, uh, then you're really, the factor that's most important that remains is dealing with chronic pathogen colonization. The microbiome in the gut is huge. You have vastly, vastly many more uh, bugs in your gut than you have cells in your body. Now, I like to put this in perspective by talking about what I call, what I consider to be the three basic forms of clinical pathogen presentations. Number one, body-wide. You know, you have a virus throughout your body, you've got influenza. Number two, focal and concentrated, like a root canal tooth or an infected tooth with an abscess. And then number three is what I would call sort of an intermediate. It's chronic pathogen colonization, which is a less focal area of pathogen growth with overall lesser concentrations of pathogens, and this is important, typically protected from eradication by persistent biofilms. And this can increase the resistance of pathogens 1,000 fold to antibiotics. Uh, you swallow it all the time, it keeps screwing up the gut all the time. This though is very important. When you're over a cold, I submit to you, you're not over the cold. I submit to you that if you have a cold and you're quote unquote over it, you feel like you're clinically normal, 
unless you take specific measures, you've screwed up the flora in your mouth, nose, and throat. And without these specific measures, even though you no longer have an acute cold, you're going to have CPC and you're going to continually poison your gut. It's characteristically, sinuses are important and not much, probably most respiratory viruses start in your sinuses because they're an area where the temperature is lower than the rest of your body. This is why you get colds when you're cold, because the coldest area of you, if you're in a cold climate, is your sinuses. And viruses love the cold, viruses break down and become uh, inactive in sufficient heat. So sinuses are the biggie, and usually the sinuses feed the nasal and oral pharynx, go deep into the throat, you can even involve the tonsils, and this is important. You affect the mucosa of the upper and lower bronchial tree. It's long been believed that the mucosal linings had no bacteria. No, it's got a normal flora, okay? And the really big biofilm is the tongue. <clears throat> now, there's currently no prescription medicine available that will reliably destroy or disrupt a persistent biofilm and kill the previously protected pathogens. Very important to realize that. However, you see the underlying statement, both hydrogen peroxide and DMSO are very effective in eliminating biofilms. And both of them, but especially hydrogen peroxide, is highly effective at killing all pathogens. I mean, if you, if you have an infected wound on your arm or leg, you pour hydrogen peroxide on it, you've nuked the pathogens. It's that simple. Remember that hydrogen peroxide is the body's own natural antibiotic. When you have infections in cells and around cells, it's the breakdown products of hydrogen peroxide that allow you to kill the pathogens and allow the organism to heal. So you eradicate and prevent CPC with nebulization of the right agents, temporary probiotics. I really don't think there's any, any reason to chronically take probiotics if you've stopped your chronic pathogen colonization. If you haven't, go ahead and take them for life. They might help, they might not. But they're very good at helping you reinstitute a normal flora once you stop the chronic poisoning with the pathogens from above. Scraping of the tongue is important too. Now, what's nebulization? That's converting a liquid agent into a fine mist that can be readily inhaled. It allows a direct contact of an agent with an infected area and allows the mobilized secretions. Much lower doses can be used in systemically and very important gives you a way to directly attack biofilms. This is a, a nebulizer, somebody using it. The little chamber is where you put whatever agent it is you want to nebulize. And these are very nice if you get one that's good quality because you can travel with them. If you're in a foreign country, you can run them on batteries. Uh, if you start to get sick on the plane, you can get up and go to the bathroom and nebulize something like hydrogen peroxide for three or four minutes and stop that virus uh, multiplication in its tracks. So, hydrogen peroxide, excellent. DMSO, excellent. I've had a, used a combination of DMSO, vitamin C, and magnesium chloride that, with regard to the clinical presentation of a cold, was able to do pretty much the same thing as hydrogen peroxide. But why make it complicated? Because hydrogen peroxide does it very well by itself. A lot of other things you can add, depending on what you're trying to deal with. Number six, very important. Only inhale water-soluble agents. Do not inhale oils or fat-soluble agents, okay? Somebody even said, because it's such a wonderful product, can I nebulize liposome vitamin C? No. That's a fact. So, uh, 
You can go anywhere from very dilute up to a full 3% solution of hydrogen peroxide. Where do you get that? Well, uh, when they're not making a run on toilet tissues and other antiseptic agents in Walmart, you can get a pint of it for 88 cents. And you can get food grade if you want, but I don't see the need. Uh, but some people are a little more compulsive about what might be present in trace amounts or something along those lines. But the 3% is the basic solution. Uh, when you have a lot of infection, it doesn't tend to burn as much. Okay, because you're dealing with a lot of mucus and everything else. When you use 3% and your sinuses and nose in a good shape, it'll, it'll burn pretty quickly and have you sneezing pretty quickly. But you don't have to torture yourself. If you have 3%, you can, you can put one cc with three or four cc's of water, make it a 1% solution, a half a percent solution. You work with whatever you tolerate well, but still clears things up. Sometimes when you overdo it, uh, and you knocked out the infection but then irritated the hell out of the mucous membranes and you're coughing, you can follow it with a vitamin C magnesium chloride nebulization, which calms those cells down really quick. As you get vitamin C and magnesium inside those inflamed cells, what happens? They normalize and they stop aggravating. Also very excellent for babies. And remember, the babies often give the infections to the adults. So don't neglect the babies because they not only need to stay well, but they're the main vector that gets you sick. You just have to be ready to uh, suction out the increased production of mucus and secretions. Tongue hygiene. Wow. The tongue is the biggest biofilm in the body. The biggest, the ugliest, the dirtiest. Remember, and this is important, <clears throat> you have a lot of fine papillae in the tongue, food gets implanted in it, along with dairy, along with everything else, and then you don't diligently clean, the biofilm forms over, and you have one of the most toxic spots in your body. Remember, the tongue cannot spontaneously clean itself any more than if you get your hands dirty gardening, they're not going to magically get the dirt off your hands. You got to go wash them. Same thing with the tongue. Uh, and remember that... Uh, It'll reform it on a daily basis. They actually showed that many of these biofilm coated tongues would singularly elevate your CRP. And when you properly scrape them and kept them from forming new biofilms, your CRP would drop. Probiotics, just a minor role. There's very little science here. As far as I can tell, they're hit and miss. You work with one until you feel that it helps you, but if you do the other measures that I'm talking about and stop polluting your gut on a daily basis with new toxins and pathogens, uh, you don't need to take lifelong, uh, lifelong probiotics. These are just some, some of the many different diseases that result from the chronic pathogen colonization with the references. Now, what's about vitamin C and all these different exotic bugs? Well, number one, Vitamin C and ozone has nuked Ebola. Dr. Rowan went to Sierra Leone, God bless his brave soul, and did this firsthand. His primary agent was ozone. He also gave some vitamin C because these natives probably don't have more than five vitamin C molecules knocking together around in their body. And if you kill all that virus suddenly, as you will with ozone, you can get a heck of a even potentially life-threatening Herxheimer reaction. So we didn't want to kill the, uh, kill the virus, but uh, have the patient not make it as well. Um, chikungunya, horrible virus, where vitamin C infusion has resolved it, hydrogen peroxide infusions have resolved it, ozone administrations have resolved it, okay? And again, published in the literature. Zika, uh, notice a pattern here, all these killer viral epidemics that just nothing can be done for except, oh my God, let's just get the researchers going on a vaccine as soon as possible. Well, maybe there'll be, I hope not, a virus someday that vitamin C, ozone, and hydrogen peroxide can't nuke, but it doesn't exist yet. So same, or, same here, high dose intravenous vitamin C completely knocked out Zika, no problem. 
So, uh, coronavirus and respiratory viruses. Good vitamin C, magnesium, vitamin D, and zinc supplementation. Obviously, there's many good supplements, but these are probably your foundational anti-infection supplements. Now, if you want to cure, God forbid, use that four-letter word, huh? Cure or res resolve coronavirus or any other virus, you want to attack it with as much vitamin C as you have available. Intravenous if possible, and especially liposome encapsulated. Now, if by chance you have ozone or you have a physician who can give you uh, an ozone treatment of your blood, that's probably the best, but it's just not that available. Uh, ozone is not that available. Vitamin C is more available, but not completely available because there's a lot of countries that won't let you use vitamin C anyway. So I'm giving you a number of different options and you have to use them depending on what's available to you and what's, mo what's most potent. Ozone most potent, vitamin C number two, and as we'll see, uh, the, um, uh, the hydrogen peroxide as well. Now remember, I wanna tell you, it's my firm belief don't, uh, don't doubt me here, folks. If you use hydrogen peroxide inhalation, you will never sustain a prolonged cold or a flu or any other viral syndrome that comes in through your respiratory tract, which is nearly all of them, okay? Just like hydrogen peroxide nukes everything in an infected wound, if you put a fine mist of it in your sinuses, your oropharynx, your nasopharynx, your upper throat, your lower throat, and the proximal part of your upper respiratory tract, you will recover and you will recover rapidly unless you're only five minutes away from being dead, okay? It works, it works well, and <clears throat> I'm gonna give you a little more information about Okay, I'm gonna tell you something at the end. Let's hang on to that. So remember that for hydrogen peroxide. I'm gonna give you a few more notes in a moment. Now, with vitamin C and coronavirus, they already started in China. They initiated a study with 24,000 milligrams infused over a seven hour period <clears throat> once a day for two weeks, and it's doing great. They're trying to do one with liposome encapsulated vitamin C, but I'd I don't think that has developed yet. Now, look what's happening in the literature. I want to tell you, we're very close to a critical mass. We're very close to vitamin C finally being ex exposed as the incredible curative agent that it is. <clears throat> look what they printed in The Lancet. I repeat, Lancet, the most mainstream of mainstream medical journals in existence. In an article that was entitled Treatment for Severe Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome from COVID-19, here's the sentence. Might not seem like much, but in this article, in this journal, it's huge. Rescue therapy, rescue therapy, so it means when it's really bad, Rescue therapy with high dose vitamin C can also be considered. Our dear Dr. Fauci leading the president's task force, he said, kind of amazing, in public, take vitamin C, it can enhance your body's defense against microbes. I take 1000 milligrams a day. Many people also do not get enough vitamin D which affects a lot of body functions. So that would be helpful too. <clears throat> now, China has gotten so much positive response to vitamin C and coronavirus, and with the help of Dr. Richard Cheng in Shanghai, believe it or not, the government of Shanghai, in an article in the Chinese Journal of Infectious Diseases 2020, has officially endorsed and promoted vitamin C as part of their protocol for treating coronavirus. Official governmental 
and medical association endorsement. I'm amazed. Now, look at this. And this might be one of the final parts of opening Pandora's box. Very recently, March 24th, an article in the New York Post, New York hospitals are treating coronavirus with intravenous vitamin C. They're not using that large a dose. They're using one and a half grams three or four times a day. I think they'll use more, but right now there's a shortage. Yes, there's a shortage. Even though the integrative medical community and people that know about vitamin C are relatively small, everybody that knows about vitamin C quickly saw that they better get their hands on as much vitamin C as they can as this coronavirus spread. Now, here, I want to give you what I consider to be a really good gift and a great bonus for taking the time to listen to me on this webinar. <clears throat> I don't know of any profession that gets a greater exposure to viruses and oral pathogens than a dentist. I mean, it's pretty much of a slam dunk logical conclusion. I would submit to you because you need to bear in mind, just like I said with chronic pathogen colonization, Lots of people, even if they don't actively have a cold, a lot of people do not have a normal flora and they're gonna breathe in your face for one, two, three, four, five hours, depending on what they're getting done. And that's a lot to take. I would submit to you, and it would not be a big deal once you set it up, to routinely have every patient that comes into your operatory to first go to another chair or in the chair that they're in, doesn't matter, and get a five to 15 minute nebulization with peroxide, peroxide, probably a low concentration on the 0.5% side before they start their dental work. Now, not only does this protect you, but it also substantially knocks down the pathogen content in the oral cavity which is always a potential complication for any of the more invasive dental work you do with things becoming infected secondarily. So it's a, a hygiene health prevention for you and it promotes the concept of a lesser chance of infection for dental work after you've done. Finally, very important, no matter how good you feel at the end of the day, believe me, you've got no idea when you have a subcritical mass of virus propagating in your nose and throat. You only know it's there once it gets above a certain titer. So I would strongly suggest to you, the physician and all the laboratory and, and dental personnel, let's not leave them out. At the end of the day, the dentist and the dental personnel should also do the nebulization before you go home. There you go, I think. Oh, one other thing I want to tell you. Okay, yeah, this is a, uh, okay. I told this, told. I don't like to give bad or unsettling news. I think a lot of what I've told you here is good news. But since we're all healthcare providers, we need the unvarnished truth, all right? Number one, I think it's very clear the coronavirus is enormously contagious, more contagious than I thought was ever possible for any bug to be. Number two, it's benign for many people and it's more vicious than I've ever seen a disease be for other persons. Don't buy this crap about old people, okay? The young people and the middle-aged people need an enormous amount of protection. Very quickly, one of my best friends, extremely healthy, 52-year-old male, just on uh, beta blockers for high blood pressure, no other medications, no other diseases, extremely healthy, lifts weights, eats a phenomenal diet, takes tons of vitamin C and all of the good supplements a day. He's been compulsive out of his mind, self-quarantined. Uh, just his wife pokes her head every now and then around where he is at the house, big house, I'm leading up to something here. And 
a matter of fact, every time his wife comes home from work, he takes all her clothes and sticks them in a bag and then puts the ozone machine on it to purify her. So he's taken it to the max. Yesterday, he went, he pushed, he, he pushed his um, garbage can out front. And when he got back, he was so out of breath, he had to sit still for three or four minutes before he could catch his breath. This is a very big, strong, healthy person. And then over the course of the next four or five hours, he went downhill so rapidly, so rapidly that by midnight, he was ready to call the emergency room or the, the, the ambulance because he couldn't breathe at all. Well, fortunately, because he's so compulsive, he had got a hold of chloroquine beforehand. And make no doubt about the BS that you're hearing on the news, chloroquine is a phenomenal bailout drug for advanced coronavirus. It pulls zinc into the cell and stops the viral replication dead in his tracks. So he took one 500 milligram, uh, a couple hours later took another one, and he went from feeling almost dead to feeling about 60 or 70% today. So be aware that this is serious. I mean, we still don't know half the time what we're being told is the truth and not is not the truth, but what I just told you right now is the truth. Be careful, take all these sanitary measures seriously, and for goodness sakes, don't overlook this huge gift I'm giving you about hydrogen peroxide nebulization. You need never family, friends, patients ever suffer from a cold or respiratory virus or influenza again. When you do it right, you chop the head off the viral snake and then the body gets rid of the rest of the virus very quickly. Thank you. Oh, doc, Dr. Levy. Yeah. Can you hear me? You yes. have a couple of questions on the chat. Sure, no problem. I mean, I, we have, yeah, no problem. Uh, one of them was from uh, Fran. She wanted to know how often daily were you advising and I think that was using the nebulizer. I tell you what, in the dental profession, I'd use it every day. I use it certainly every day that you work. I mean, you know, if you feel perfectly fine and it's a weekend, yeah, go ahead and skip it. And you know, there's nobody sick in the house, but with, uh, with the pathogen exposure that, uh, that a dentist has, I would do it every day prophylactically. No, I think you were talking about when somebody was ill using it. So if someone oh. is ill, how would you suggest they do it? Okay, very good question. And, and you need to remember that the hydrogen peroxide is non-toxic. I mean, if you get it too concentrated, it might burn or sting or something like that, but it's non-toxic. So in that regard, uh, you do a 15 minute nebulization, something along those lines. Uh, and really, if you're already sick, you want to do it at least three or four times the first day. And nearly every time you'll have a dramatic symptomatic improvement. That doesn't mean you stop. You just know it's working. And then the next day you continue that. And if at the same time you're taking your vitamin C and if you have access, a little intravenous, this out of the other, or if God forbid you think it's the coronavirus, um, I don't know how readily available it is. It's, it is a prescription agent, but it's a prescription agent that has long since been approved by the FDA for uh, rheumatoid arthritis and a number of other conditions. And anything that's approved by the FDA for any reason can be prescribed by a licensed healthcare practitioner for whatever purpose they want. So what about using quinine water? I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't. I, I don't know how similar that is to chloroquine. I mean, uh, the thing. The thing about chloroquine, and I don't know about the quinine water, is it's a. It opens up transport mechanisms inside the cell that allows zinc to get in, because zinc, of course, is an ionic charge situation, and with anything ionic needs assistance to get into the cell. It's only the tiny nonpolar. Uh, molecules that pass through the cells easily. So I don't know about quinine water. I don't know. Okay. And someone else uh, 
had a question on here. Do you feel like the current uh, COVID-19 is more contagious than influenza B? I think it's the most contagious bug so far in the history of the world, okay? I mean, I've seen what's happening. I think right now, many, many, many millions of people in the States have it and have had it, okay? So I, I, there is obviously a large asymptomatic group that gets through it. And I can't figure out why it's so nasty in some people and so benign in other people. But I know in my own small circle of family, friends, and associates, 12, 13 people, a majority of them got sick. Now, I don't know if it's all coronavirus, but I've never seen a majority of them sick at the same time before, any time in my life. So something's yeah. good. And that's in different countries. That's in here, and that's in Colombia. That's, so it's, in my opinion, with my deduction, I think it's far and away the most contagious syndrome that's ever existed to date. Uh, I, I certainly hope it's not genetically engineered because all they need to do is take something like this and then somehow make it resistant to vitamin C and then we're really up, up the tree. Up right. the tree. And, and then I have a, I guess another comment on here. It says, um, I'm doing the hydroxychloroquine for RA. Do you think it's acting as a preventative measure? Absolutely. And I think that's one good reason why there's been such a low incidence in large amounts of Africa, because many of them have been treated with these agents for malaria. I would say this, if you're taking hydroxychlor hydroxychloroquine for uh, these other uh, indications as a prescription, do make sure that in addition to the supplementation we talk about, Make sure you're taking a good zinc product on a regular basis because that's the fuel that chloroquine is using to uh, protect you against the virus is getting, vi getting uh, zinc inside the cells. So just make sure you have enough zinc circulating in your system so that if you do have a challenge with the virus, uh, it's able to get a lot of zinc inside the virus or inside the cells that are infected with the virus so that you can uh, you can stop the infection. So, but I'm not talking about large amounts. Just a you know, I think zinc a lot is something along the lines of like 20 milligrams a day, a chelated product, something like that. Okay. And one last question. I know myself. Uh, I have tried contacting every connection I have for vitamin C. Got any tips on where to find it? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Whoa. I mean, yeah, my. Live on Labs is churning it out nonstop, and they're still working on back orders. And yeah, that, they won't even take an order. Right I know now. they won't even take an order. Now. I and uh, it's not funny. Don't get me wrong. It's it's interesting that after Dr. Andrew Saul uh, with the Orthomolecular Medicine News Service and his Facebook page initially started talking about the role of vitamin C. Uh, and coronavirus and other viruses, and this was like about a month and a half ago, wow, within a couple of weeks, you couldn't even get vitamin C off the shelf at Walmart. No, I know. So, so there's, it's, that's why I said, even though a majority of the planet <clears throat> and the doctors think uh, vitamin C is, eh, it's okay, just a small percentage of people that know about it have well, they've made a run on vitamin C like they've made on toilet tissue. But the, but the vitamin C makes more, makes more sense. <laughs> it sure does. Well, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. You've always been so generous to us and in giving information. Uh, you guys, if, if you have any further questions, uh, please feel free to contact Dr. Levy at the... Um, contact that you see here on this last slide. And this will be available as soon as I can get it up on the internet so that everybody can rewatch. I mean, I, I, I can't emphasize enough really how important the, the, the last suggestions are 
for maintaining your health as a dental practitioner. I mean, there's, it, it is so easy to do and so effective. And, and that's something that I don't know that anybody else has spoken of before. That, that to me was new information. I mean, I use the nebulizer, but just at home, I've never really thought about taking it to the office. So that, that was worth the twice the price of our free admission tonight. <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, well, thank you, Dawn. Thank you. Tomorrow night will be Kelly Blodgett. So y'all stay tuned. Thanks okay. so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.